I'm going to invite you, if you would, to turn in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21. In a moment, I'm going to read the first three verses. The title of the message that's been burning on my heart, and I know is applicable to each one of you, as well as myself, is for you to hear, maybe for the first time, the Master, the Lord Jesus, saying to you personally, not just corporately, but individually and personally, the Master has need of you. The Master has need of you. Now you may say, oh no, am I going to get called into full-time ministry? Do I have to have reverend in front of my name now and stand behind a pulpit and preach and teach? Is that what you're talking about? Does it mean I'm going to become a missionary, go overseas? I would never subtract that from the potential equation of God speaking, but I don't want to accentuate that. I want you to be open to the fact that in the context of your career, your livelihood, your profession, your training in that arena, God today, this week, this month, this year, wants to use you in a profound way. The master in your sphere of influence, in your web environment, in your place of work, occupation, career, in the home, the Lord has need of you. The master has need of you. Hear that. I know that that is so strong in his heart. And we're going to look at the story here recorded in Matthew 21 about a rope and a colt. And the fact of what God was doing here, and I believe a literal picture to be given, and then a picture by allegory. Matthew 21 in verses 1 through 3, it says this, now when they drew near to Jerusalem, then jumping to Jesus, sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them, bring them to me. And if anyone, anyone says anything, anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them. Now if you look up here, whenever you take a text, it's a very important hermeneutic. Hermeneutics is the science of how one interprets the Bible. That you take it literally. That's the good, strong, conservative approach. Inappropriate. But you don't have to isolate yourself to just one interpretation because there are many applications of one particular text. You always have to take the text in its context, and then you apply different principles of interpretation to make sure that you're hearing what God is saying to you personally, what he was saying then, and what he's saying now. And a literal interpretation here is to be taken. Of course, Jesus is entering into Jerusalem. No, this is not Palm Sunday, but this is a day when Jesus is entering into Jerusalem. And though we've already celebrated Palm Sunday, this text is the one that records this great entrance into Jerusalem. And he does something that fulfills an Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah. It's recorded in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And basically it declares that he will come into Jerusalem riding upon the colt of a donkey. Now, the image there, of course, translates to us of his humility. But also, contextually, when you peer back into the Old Testament, you realize that when a king would enter into a town or a city, if he rode upon a war horse, that was a symbolic declaration to the people. A strong leader is coming in with great authority, almost like a tyrant, to establish his rule his regime with power, force, great authority. Riding in on that war horse was a strong statement, probably stimulated intimidation 
to those who would look upon the king coming in on a war horse because it spoke of strength and power and authority and the strong hand that would descend upon anyone who rebelled against that authority. Almost the antithesis of that is when an Old Testament king would ride into a town or a city on a donkey. That communicated the message not only of humility, but a benevolent despot that would establish peace among the people. Peace, a stability, even potentially a tranquility in the sense that everyone would be esteemed and recognized, honored. Their individuality would be applauded, yet there needed to be a submission to this despot. But he was benevolent. He was a king. But he was marked by the reality of great humility, great peace. That's a profound picture given to us. And I underscore its relevance in the literal interpretation of that reality to all of our hearts that Jesus desires to ride into the chambers of our own hearts and established, establish his peace in us, yes. But I'd like to also invite you to consider what was pressed on my heart of a little bit more of an allegorical interpretation. An allegorical interpretation is basically you're taking a a metaphor and you're extending it. And the metaphor here would be the cult. The cult representing you and me. And the invitation from the Lord to come to him so that he might ride upon our life into this generation so that others would see him more than simply seeing us. Yes, it's an allegory, and an allegory usually has a one-to-one -one correspondence with every component of the story. So in one sense, this is a little bit more of a parable because there's one main principle I want you to grab onto, but it is an allegory. We have the liberty to do that because you get examples of that in other portions of the Old and New Testament. But I believe that that's a picture that the Lord wants you to see for it to be impressed upon your mind, an image that you would see your life and you would say, Lord, you've given me talents and, and gifts and abilities. He doesn't want us to bury them, but he wants us to bow them over. Some of you have been given amazing talents. Some of you might look and assess and say, no, I don't have any profound talent. You might say, well, I have one, another has two, another has five, who cares? Stop comparing and reflect on the fact of what God has deposited into you. Don't minimize it by comparison. Lord, you've given me this ability, an artistic gifting, or maybe an athletic gifting, or maybe he's made you so strong intellectually that he wants you to go into a certain science area and use that talent for his glory. Maybe you have... Uh, great creativity or in the business realm you just know how things can work for the advancement of a product and to be successful with that maybe you're an outstanding mechanic and you have a gift with working with a car or a boat maybe you are amazing secretary logistics just come second nature to you I don't know of course all of us in the home, if you're single, the friendships you have, if you're married as a wife or a husband, as a mom or a dad, a parent, a grandparent, and there's skills and there's gifts and talents that God gives to you to impart and mentor and for others to come under your tutelage so you can disciple them. All of us have been given talents and gifts and abilities. And though it might seem heroic, even humble to bury them, it's the very opposite of the heartbeat of God. He wants you and me, like that colt of the donkey, to bow it over and say, Lord, the gifts that you've given me, be them many or few, I bow them over, I submit them to you, and I invite you, Lord, to ride upon the abilities you've given me 
upon the talents and the gifts that you've given me. Ride upon them, O Lord, into this my generation, so that when they see me, they'll really see you. And in that, you'll be revealed, you'll be glorified. You see, the master says, I have need of you. He doesn't want to just walk in. He wants to ride your life in and the gifts he's given you. But he needs you to respond to him. He needs you to say, all right, Lord, I submit everything you've given me to you. And use it for your glory. But you have to answer this probably first before we could go any further in this message. Do you, no, I mean you, do you really believe that this all-sufficient God has need of you? In his providence, in his sovereignty, omnipotent, full of power, omnipresent, present everywhere, omniscient, he knows all things, Almighty God needs me or needs you? Well, I'll go ahead at this moment and capitulate and acknowledge the fact that I'm in agreement with you deep on your heart. No, he really doesn't technically need you or me. He's all sufficient in and of himself. God is providential and he is sovereign. I'm Pentecostal. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not a Calvinist, not a five-point Calvinist, not even like a uh, John Piper, a seven-point Calvinist, but I do like a good, healthy injection of the providence and sovereignty of God put into my DNA to remind me He is big, He is in control, He's sovereign, providential over all. And I agree, he doesn't need me and he doesn't need you. However, I also know pulsating in this book, the Bible, is the reality and the truth that he wants to use you and me. He wants to. He desires to do it. It's not on the basis or the foundation of this dependence. He depends on no one. He's undergirded by nothing. He's sufficient in and of himself. He's almighty God. However, on the basis of delight to his heart, not independence, but a delight to his heart, he wants to use you and use me. When you allow that to envelop your mind, grip your heart, then you say, all right, Lord, I'm ready to answer this second question. What does the master need you to do? No, no, no. I know it's rhetorical, but you have to reflect on this. He gave this as a message to me to give to you. What does the master need for you? To do. Now you may have a blank tablet. You might have no response. But if you would just give him your ear and your heart, believe me, he'll begin to write something. You may even hear him say something, not audibly, but you'll hear him say something in your spirit. Something for today, for this week, for this month, for this year. For the remainder of your life. The master has need of you. What is he saying he wants you to do? Again, please don't limit this. Don't set boundaries around a call by defining it only and solely in the context of an ordained minister. A good friend of mine at ORU, I remember he said, Gary, I feel so strongly that God is calling me to be an actor in Hollywood. Well, there might be an initial resistance on our part and say, oh no, that's anathema. 
But he knew that he knew that he knew God was calling him, had given him gifts and talents and abilities. And he wanted to bow them over and say, Jesus, would you ride me in to Hollywood so I can be the witness there that you need me to be? Oh, I know some in here might be resistant to that. But it's not your voice he's to yield to. It's the voice of the Lord who says, the master has need of you. That's how you're moved, motivated, dictated to. I love each one of you. I appreciate each one of you. But God forbid that I allow your voice to get around my neck like a rope and become a noose. God forbid that I would allow you to pull on my life and redirect my steps, even when it comes to the issue of what would be preached from this pulpit. I know I get recommendations. I get encouragement. Pastor, would you preach about heaven? The same day I'll get an email, preach about hell. Preach about the second coming and eschatology. No, speak about practical living and a marriage relationship. There's a plethora of opinions. I understand that. I don't misinterpret that. I don't take that as a threat, but I'll tell you what I do know I have to do. I'm not going to stand before you and give an answer for the message that I deliver to you each Sunday. I'm going to stand before God and give account for that one day. I fear Him. So as much as I appreciate everything you may lay on the table, for me to consider as a series that I would cover or a sermon to be preached, with all due respect to you, I have to listen to Him. And all I would ask you to do, if you feel very intensely about that, would you match my commitment to seeking Him for what He wants me to speak? Join with me in intense prayer and fasting? Would you fall before Him and cry out with everything in your being, what do you want to speak to your people this Sunday? Meet with me. You match that, and I'm sorry if it sounds bragging, but if you match that, I'll, I'll give my ear to something that you might say to me. But please, don't come with a sloppy suggestion just simply because it stimulates your interest level in that given area. I've had some who said, please, you've got to speak about the second coming. Do you even believe it, Pastor? Of course I believe in the second coming. I've studied eschatology maybe a little bit more than you. Go through the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Study it. Exegete it. Hear what God is saying. Consider Matthew 24, Matthew 25. Everything that Jesus had to say about the end days. Yes, my whole being pulsates with that reality. It runs like DNA within me. Yes. After much study, I formed the very same conclusion David Wilkerson did when he said, you know what, when it's all said and done, I... I don't know when he's coming, but I know who's coming. I don't know when he's coming, but I know who is coming. And so, God has me do a series starting next week on the second coming. I'm going there, and we're going there together. But I always say this, before I'd ever teach you about the second coming, I'd like to know how you're handling the first coming. <laughs> how are you handling his lordship over your life? your commitment in your marriage, your morality, your ethics. How is your witness shining like a bright light and beacon in this world? How are you handling the first coming of the master? Before we talk about his second coming, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yesterday I got a wonderful message on the phone. <laughs> sometimes it's wonderful, sometimes it's challenging. When something like this, Pastor Zarlingo, I'm sorry, that was the intonation. <laughs> I'm so upset with you. Last Sunday was Resurrection Sunday. You didn't speak about the cross, and you didn't speak about the resurrection. I'm so disappointed with you. And then they hung up. Now, you, do you see what happens when you fall asleep when I'm preaching? <laughs> huh? Do you see what happens? He had to doze off. I know my notes probably mentioned the resurrection over 200 and some times in the cross. I'm preaching on the implication of the resurrection in, a, in an individual's life. All right, we're off topic. <laughs> what does the master need for you to do? It's unique. He told Noah, 
I need you to build a boat. He told Moses, I need you to extend your staff for the splitting of the water and the deliverance that would be brought to the people of Israel. He told Deborah, I need you to, Deborah, you need to fight a fierce battle for me. Esther, I need to use you to protect my nation from genocide. Paul, I need to send you to the Gentiles. Peter, I need to send you to the Jewish community. I need you. The master has need of you in your sphere of influence where God allows you to be. He wants to use you. But what stops that? What hinders that? Well, let's revisit the text. There was the donkey and the colt. They were together. They were tied up to a post. Tied up to a post. Let me just allow us to just consider the imagery there. The donkey the mother, the colt, a male, young donkey tied up together. Now, this is not in any way speaking simply to mothers. I'm going to broaden it to say it speaks to any of us who have someone in our life that we're near, a young person that we have the power to influence. Maybe it is as a mom or a dad in your parenting or maybe you're an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent or a good friend. Please be cautious. Don't allow the restrictions and the boundaries that you've set in your life to be superimposed upon them. I know that my father wanted me to become an attorney. My grandfather wanted me to become a college professor. I'm not saying that any of that was intrinsically evil in and of itself. They were wanting to inspire me to, to do something big and great. And we need to, be it a, a dad or a mom, you should, as the scripture says, kaleo, that means uh, encouragement, to call forth their potential and their call. But God forbid that you would identify from your own self what that call should be. You rope them. You entangle them. You prevent them from fulfilling what God has called them to be and to do. You may have had aspirations in your own heart and life that were never met. And so you almost want to yoke your son or your daughter to that and say, this is what you can be. This is what you can do. You have to encourage them. Seek what the Lord wants you to do. I'm not going to superimpose upon you or press into you my presuppositions of how I think God's going to use you. God forbid. Oh, there's a temptation because you want to inspire those that you are mentoring and influencing, but you've got to inspire them by saying, seek the Lord. He's given you gifts. He's given you talents. He's given you abilities, but you seek the Lord and you discern what God wants you to be. And you may say, I want you to be an accountant, but they're looking at you and saying, no, I feel God wants me to go to med school, and, but not to practice in the States. I'm to be a medical missionary. And that parent might say, well, you're not going to make any money that way, and that's not going to be good for my retirement. <laughs> Don't cause them to have a rope around them from you. That's all I'm saying to you. In that passage, it makes it pretty clear that as they were invited to be loosed, Jesus said that there would be some around and if anyone says anything to you, you say to them, the Lord has need of them. I remember a friend of mine, I said this two years ago, I said, you know what, I feel like God's given me some talents and I want to use them for him and I'm going to be a, 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 maybe a teacher in a Bible college. And I did that for 10 years. But at this time it was not. And I remember he looked at me and goes, you? you got to be kidding See, when the Lord comes to remove the rope, there will be the clamor of others that might say, You keep her tied, keep him tied to the post. You got to be kidding. It's not logical, it's not reasonable. Look at you. 
You can't. You won't. You'll stay. There you have to be strong and say, no, no voice other than the voice of the Lord is going to control me. No voice is going to define my limitations. Only God is going to speak over my life, and I'm going to listen to him. And so when the Lord comes and says, loose them and bring them to me, realize the only thing between that donkey colt and Jesus was a rope. Was the only thing. So, I'm going to paint for you very rapidly some ropes, yep, ropes, that you'll find in the Bible over different lives. Ropes that got around their neck, and a neck is always symbolic of, of human will. Rope that got around their neck and held them to the post. So there's where they would die. The danger, you heard me speak about spiritual warfare. Well, the enemy will sneak into a situation like that. And there may be a lot of natural things and human things and, and, and people and society and culture itself, even friends, that it all makes sense here. They'll, they'll, they'll just rope you down. You'll rope yourself down. The devil will take advantage, and I'll tell you what he'll do. He'll take that rope... And he'll turn it into a hangman's noose because he's the father of lies and he's a murderer. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to do nothing but rob, steal, kill, and destroy. So be careful when you think, well, this is, this is just a rope around me and it's holding me down and holding me back. One day I'll deal with it. I tell you, when the Spirit of the Lord identifies a rope in my life that's around my neck, that's holding me to a post that I ought not to be connected to, that's paralyzing my life, I realize I'm also a potential candidate for a demonic force to sweep in there and grab on that rope and turn it into a noose. And if I stay there too long, I could become a man that's lost or died to his whole identity and, and his whole destiny. So... I'm going to show you very quickly pictures from the Old and New Testament, very quickly. Now, you may land on one particular one. That's the one that the Spirit of the Lord is going to drive into you and minister to you. That ministry may be instantaneous. You may suddenly experience that rope coming right off your neck, and you're hearing the call, the Master has need of you. And like that donkey and colt, you'll move right toward him, and he'll come upon you and ride you in to your generation. Or it may initiate a process of you saying, wow, this is a rope around me. I can't seem to get it off. I need some godly counsel, godly input, some spiritual truth and advice to be brought to me so that though it may not be instantaneous, it'll put me on a path that I'll progressively get this rope off my neck. I'm not sure, but I know that the Holy Spirit's going to show you. This list is not exhaustive. These pictures are not exhaustive by any means. It may trigger something because that's been my prayer for you through this week. God, remove the ropes. When I stood out in the parking lot early this morning, no car was here. It's like I almost saw that as a vision of God by his spirit coming down and taking ropes off of necks, off of necks, and just a whole army of men and women free and obedient to God's voice and bringing their life like a donkey and saying, ride upon me, Jesus, into this my generation and receive all the glory, honor, and praise that you're worthy of, that when they see me, they'll see you. Now, my prayer is that you will see that and experience that happen. The first picture you'll see with Gideon, there was a rope around his neck. It was the rope of a poor self-concept. Now, I'm not here just to be a psychologist and try to stir you up and give you a message on self-esteem, but there's something to you stopping and saying, God, you created me. You made me. I'm not garbage and I'm not junk. You have created me. 
I was fallen. You redeemed me. I'm still undergoing that process of sanctification. But nevertheless, I won't echo what was stated by Gideon in Judges 6.15 when he said, Lord, how can I save Israel? I'm the least in my father's house. That may sound heroic. It may even be attributed to humility. But it does nothing for the kingdom. And it becomes a rope around your neck just saying, I don't think God could ever use me. A picture of Gideon leads us to a picture in the New Testament of Thomas. This was a rope of A, I use the indefinite article, A perception. Remember, perspective is how you see reality. That's perspective. Perception is even more serious. It's how you interpret reality. See, you're seeing it here. This is reality. But then how you interpret it, how that translates to you is your perception. That's when it becomes very personal and intimate. Perspective can be very broad. Perception is very specific because it's your interpretation. Thomas had a perception, a perception of God. And this is how he saw it. God you're going to do things on my terms. This is how you're going to do it. Now, this is a, a, a text that reveals the grace of God. Because Jesus, eight days later, will visit, come into the room, and respond to that question that was lifted, or that statement that was declared by Thomas in a milieu of unbelief in John 20, verse 25. When, when Thomas said, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, I'll not believe. Eight days later, Jesus comes and says, I'm here, and Thomas, come here. This is how you wanted me to reveal myself to you. You ignored my sovereignty. You ignored how I was going to do it. And you, you demanded, basically, that it would be done your way. And in his benevolence, his mercy, and his grace, he said, all right, go ahead. Feel. Go ahead. Feel. And then, of course, Thomas bows his knee and says, My Lord and my God. But Jesus says, I'm going to bestow a blessing, but it's not going to be a blessing on you. It's going to be a blessing on all those who do it my way. Those who won't be able to visibly see me but believe. See, sometimes we're tied to a rope of our perception of God. God, you've got to do it this way on my terms. If you really exist, then, then show yourself to me. I mean, literally visit me. Send an angel to me. Do something on my terms. I want to feel the handprints. I want to put my hand into your side. Do it this way. He was gracious to Thomas. But that's not his typical mode of operating. He is God. No, no. He is God. He's in charge. Yes, he is our father, but he is almighty God. So Lord, do it in the way you want to do it. Don't allow that rope of a perception that you may have of God having to always do everything on your terms. You'll be stuck to a post. You may be justified from experience and say it's justified. But you'll move nowhere. John Mark had the rope of failure. You have any failures in your life? Rope around your neck, tied you to the post. John Mark on the first missionary journey that backs out on Paul and Barnabas. And John departed from them and returned to Jerusalem. But when you hear the end of the story, it's beautiful that it was Peter, Peter basically, that went to John Mark and took the rope off his neck and discipled him to the point that John Mark will pen the gospel of Mark, but it really reflects all of the thoughts of Peter. It's basically the gospel of Peter penned by the by the disciple Mark. 
was redeemed, but the rope had to be removed, and God happened to use a person to help get that off. It was Peter in John Mark's life. Mary Magdalene, the rope of rejection. Have you ever felt the presence of strong rejection? How about the rejection of apostles in a state of unbelief? The scripture says in Luke 24, 11, their words, these are the words of the 11 apostles, seemed, these are the words of Mary, I should say, coming back and making a declaration of the resurrection of Christ. And then the response is coming from these 11 apostles. And they said their words were like idle tales. And they didn't believe. Imagine, could you imagine? It's one thing to be rejected by the world. How about other believers? How about believers that are in leadership? And you feel that rejection it becomes a rope around your neck, it stops you. The Apostle John, the rope of disappointment. Now, when I was preparing this message, this is where God spoke to me. And he showed me I had a rope around my neck. You see, when you're developing a message, not just out of study and it's not just academic, but it's the Holy Spirit helping you and he's going to press something into you. I'm not going to tell you what the disappointment was in my life. But I realized it needed to be removed. In this story, in Acts chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, is the only recorded account of one of the apostles being martyred. In the Martyria, there'll be the account of all of the apostles, except the apostle John that was martyred. But that's coming from historical facts and tradition, and even some that are legendary. But here is the account of the brother of John. Remember, this is John the Apostle. His brother is James. And in Acts chapter 2, it says that he was beheaded by Herod. That's King Agrippa. Herod, who was the grandson of King Herod. And it says he killed him with the sword. Probably was beheaded. He's the first apostle, not the first believer. That was Stephen in Acts 7. But the first apostle to be martyred. And that was the brother of John. Traditional accounts indicate that John was so discouraged. His, his partner, his colleague, his brother. Remember James and John? James and John? He's slain at the very inception of the ministry. God, why? That's not how we prayed. The miracles that should manifest. But there was a rope of disappointment that had to be lifted from the head of even the great apostle John. I don't know if that lands in your life. It landed in mine. And I had to let the Lord, because I, I was stopped. I was paralyzed. It was a disappointment. He didn't answer the prayer that I thought he would answer. And God had to take that off. And I could feel the freedom that he wants to bring to all of us. The Apostle Peter, the rope of shame. The shame. If you look up the definition of shame, it's disgrace, the embarrassment, being humiliated by some action or something from the past. And it just, it just gets around you, the shame. Disgrace. It's interesting that that word, dis, the Latin is for uh, apart from, you're apart from grace. Disgrace, you're apart from grace. And that will always result in a shame that will come over you. Peter wept bitterly, and that rope of shame had to be lifted. If it would have remained, I think he would have done the same thing Judas did. Well, that's your theology? Yes, yeah, my theology bleeding through. Forgive me. Job, the rope of deep wounds. Do you have some deep wounds in your life? You could stay there. Now, I don't know if those can be instantaneously healed. I think there's a process in that. You see it with Job when he makes that cry from Job 3 and verse 11. Why did I not die at birth? These wounds are so deep and so real. And then you see the Apostle Paul, that rope of inability. Hey, as much as you're trying to rally us, there's no ability in me to do something for God in my sphere of influence. Remember, I say this to you almost ad nauseum. When you believe a lie, something in you will die. 
It'll move from a paralysis of a rope that pulls you and holds you to a noose that kills you when you believe a lie. And you have to say, okay, apart from you, I can do nothing. John 15. But Philippians 4, 13 says, but through Christ, I can do all things, all things. Paul identifies, he says, I know what it feels like to be in need. That rope of inability, I know it, but may it be removed. So that, yes, in conclusion, you could be that son and daughter that allows Jesus, behold, the king is coming. That we're a people where that rope, be it of shame, be it a rope of disappointment, be it a rope of inability, be it whatever that rope might be, even the rope of a specific sin or an expectation that someone has of you. The list can go on and on and on and on that that rope is removed from the neck, the engagement of your will, and you respond, the master has need of me. The master's calling me, and I'm going to show up. I'm not going to be all tied up, restricted and paralyzed, and I'm not going to be here in a breeding ground of potential death. No, the master has need of me. So by your spirit, remove this rope, remove this potential noose, and I'm moving in your direction, and I'm going to bow over all that I have and say, Jesus, ride me in. King Jesus, ride me in to this generation, and may you be glorified. Can we stand together? I believe with all my heart this is applicable to every single one of us. Every single one of us. And so the altar is going to be right where you're at. Because if I open the altar, I think every one of us should come forward. So the altar is right where you're at. Would you just close your eyes? I don't care if you're young or old, strong or weak. God by His Spirit is speaking to you. Is it that rope of your past, that failure, that shame? Is it a rope of comparison? Bring it now to the Lord. If in his sovereignty he wanted me to speak about this, he wouldn't do this to tease you or torment you. When he reveals something, he comes with power to do something about it. So lift your heart and say, Lord, lift this off my neck. That there be no rope between me and you. Nothing but obedience and a soul set free. I exalt you, Lord. Let this be your moment of just praying. Pastor, Matt's going to sing this song, but just let this be your moment with the Lord. Don't wander in a grace moment. Don't let your mind jump to somewhere else. Not in a grace moment. Not in a moment when the Holy Spirit, like a hand from heaven, wants to lift that rope off your neck and get you away. You'll die at that post. Do you want to die there? Not me. Uh Uh-uh. I want Jesus to ride my life in to this generation. The master has need of you. And I will exalt you, Lord. I will exalt you, Lord. There is no one like by faith, would you just begin to lift that? Yes, with my life, I bow it down before you, Lord. May you be seen and exalted. Lift 
lift that again with your whole heart. And I will exalt you, Lord. I will exalt you, Lord. No other name be lifted high. No other name be lifted high. No other name be lifted high. I will exalt you, Lord. Now I pray this blessing upon your life. I pray that no rope would hold you down and hold you back. That that rope would never, ever, ever evolve into a noose. But you'll be free. Loose them. By your spirit and by your power, O oh Lord God Almighty. That you will bow your life down before him in worship. That your life will be blessed by the presence of the Lord Jesus. So upon you that others will truly, truly see him in your life. I pray that you will. Surely fulfill your call. I pray this blessing upon you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let it be upon your life. Would you say now, I receive this, Lord? No, I mean, I receive this, Lord. So let it be.